Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That guy over there, Tim Dennis. We've got supernatural news, parashare. That means people's stories they have sent into us, Tim. Dave at darknessradio.com. We also have a brand new theater of the mind that will be coming up a little bit later on in today's program. Timothy David Dennis. Uh, you, you want to give out my social too? or uh, 358 hey, 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 hey. What? I thought you were asking me to do that. I'm trying no, to... no. I'm oh, just, you just yeah. said, do you want to give it out? I, I thought maybe you were testing like that guy that does the life lock. He gives out a social because he's like, look how protected I am. No, I'm not that protected. I'm just saying, you're just throwing out my government name and all that other stuff. I mean, well, okay. you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that uh, your mom named your middle name after me. I just thought that was a very eloquent move in her life. No, she just liked the combination because it meant child of God. Mm, I like it. I like it. Well, we've got stories to share, Tim. Mm-hmm. We've got uh, emails to share. We've got news to share. And I'm just trying to figure out where I want to start with this because I'm just afraid I'm going to give you a heart attack if I start right out with AI. But damn it, I find this story fascinating. Oh, for the love of God. There's a new Microsoft patent that aims to revive the dead as a chatbot, Tim. Uh huh. I win. Yeah. Digital tech <laughs> behemoth Microsoft has been granted a patent that aims to revive the deceased as an artificial intelligence chatbot. The concept sounds like it was ripped straight out of science fiction story, largely in part because an episode of Netflix original program Black Mirror has an episode called Be Right Back from season two, episode one, and the Amazon Prime show upload are based around this exact premise of uploading digital information about a person in order to continue to communicate with them post-mortem. Ostensibly, the larger someone's carbon footprint is, the more accurately their persona will be portrayed by this AI. Images, voice data, social media posts, and electronic messages of all sorts are factored into recreating a digital afterlife render of the deceased and Microsoft has even begun uh, to plot multidimensional, that's 2D and 3D models of those who are no longer among the living. Communication between living people and these new digital variants is expected to be activated through both voice and chat command services. The patent states that, per the independent, the specific person who the chatbot re- represents may correspond to a past or present entity of a version thereof, such as a friend, a relative, an acquaintance, a celebrity, a fictional character, historical figure, a random entity. The specific person may also correspond to oneself. An example, the user creating or training that chatbot. Would you ever consider using technology or something like this to allow you to communicate with somebody posthumously, Tim? It's creepy, Dave. It's goddamn creepy. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Think about it. All of the shows we've done, 15 years worth of data. So basically, our avatars are going to tell fart and poop jokes and lots of Uranus stories. Much in a showbiz and Chuck E. Cheese-like manner. So, okay, so you're pumping through the audio and then you just see these gums flapping. It'd be very weird. Yeah, well, they'll be able to, you know, it'll basically be uh, Obi-Wan, you're our last hope, right? I mean, it'll be this projection of you. But it'd be, I don't know, that might be comforting. Wouldn't it be comforting to, you know, on those days when you're just having a rough go of it, uh, just flip a switch and Grandpa Dennis pops up in front of you? And you're able to kind of talk things through with him and all of the information it could call, call about his personality and uh, all of his spoken words and social imprints and everything would be kind of pulled into this. But it's not him. Right. But wouldn't that still give you that kind of, you know, people feel comforted just talking to the air around them as though the loved one is still with them. This would give a, a visual representation for setting that intent. But it's a creepy robot. It's not him. <laughs> Well, it's not a robot. It's just uh, AI. It's just uh, a chatbot talking to you. 
but it had seemed like him. And they would have like our voices, Tim. People in 2079, my 110th birthday, Tim, could flip a switch to see what young, spry, uh, you know, Dave and Tim look like and converse with them and ask them about the paranormal and their thoughts on the paranormal. And their favorite stories, because it all exists in digital land, Tim. Think about that. How can we, uh, how can we monetize it? Advertise now? Start selling <laughs> tickets for the 110th <laughs> Dave Schrader birthday? <laughs> My Big skin is up. crawling just thinking about it. Ugh, no. That's hurtful. That's mm. hurtful. It, ugh. Mm. I don't know. I think that's hurtful, Tim. I'm going to be honest with you. So you're not a big fan no. of this AI no. concept. Mm -mm. I, I think I am. I think I like it. I, I, seriously, I'd love to hear from listeners. Dave at darknessradio.com. What do you think? Would it comfort you? I, I miss my mom so much. I think having any kind of uh, visual representation of her would make me feel better and be able to talk to her. And not just hear her voice in my head and make me kill people in the hotel that we run together, Tim. You know, just so I've got that that <laughs> grounded feature. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about AI, Tesla's having a problem this week, Tim. Tesla mm. has something called autopilot. Okay. But it seems that it's having trouble driving through a cemetery. Here's why. <laughs> in case you didn't know, Tesla vehicles are capable of an autopilot mode where they can drive almost fully on their own. The car utilizes multiple camera, um, a kind of a radar and an ultrasonic sensor and a computer to navigate roads and surroundings. Mm -hmm. Amazingly, though, the autopilot can sense when people are around the vehicle and it will react accordingly. Right. One dude with a Tesla tried out autopilot mode while going through a cemetery and something really strange happens. The display shows that there's a person nearby the car. Although you can see from his visual perspective, there's no one there. And since it is a cemetery, you can draw your own conclusions, but it is pretty weird. I don't, have you seen this video footage? I have not. I've been in a Tesla before. I've, mm -hmm. I've ridden in one, so I know what you're talking about, but. It's pretty cool, but it's interesting that it's working kind of like an SLS camera. Right? It's it's going through the as the guy's driving through the cemetery, the car stops because it senses a human approaching. And you see this avatar figure kind of walking towards the car and then it starts going back towards the graves. It's it's pretty cool. Where can I see this video, Dave? This video you claim exists from this dude. Well, I've got a link for it. You can go check out the link by going to darknessradio.com and click on the news tab, and it'll be one of the stories are under today's news. But it's a cool feature. It's it's interesting. But wow, what does that tell you? Maybe this guy was being hunted by the predator. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe a ghost. Ghost in the graveyard. So that's uh, that's kind of an interesting story where AI uh, seems to be noticing spirits. Tim, that's good news, isn't it? Uh, sure. Yeah, they can huh? they can battle it out. All right, let's go to an email, Tim. Mm -hmm. This email comes to us uh, from David. How do you think he starts this email, Tim? <laughs> from David to David, it'd be uh, Dear Dave. Hello, Dave. I'm going to give that to you, Tim. Mm -hmm. I was listening to your show on the topic of near-death experiences. The point you made about dying and not experiencing what other people have experienced. Truly, I believe no one has an answer for your dilemma on that. Although, something interesting did come up in the conversation. Oh, Something interesting came out of the conversation, just, Tim. Just something, yeah. I'm glad. You know, I'd feel bad if at least one good thing didn't come out. Well, yeah. yeah. About human memory surviving. Well, according to the Bible, and I'm not Bible thumping, that's what it says in this article, it does survive. It goes back into the earth and becomes part of the ground collect or the grand collective, not the ground collective, two different things, Tim. Mm -hmm. It goes back into the earth and becomes part of the grand collective of the earth memory. Not quoting word for word here, but from the ground you were taken and from the ground you will return. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes, and all that good stuff. It is why it is so important not to burn the body after death. And this is one of the ways an investigator can tell if the place is haunted by a human memory, a spirit, or a non-human entity. Find out if the deceased has been cremated. 
Now, a typical example of this is in our own timeline of living. It is called the computer and random access memory. You turn the computer off, it's dead, it does nothing. It can give nothing. It just sits there. You put the energy back into the computer and it brings up the memory it had before it was last turned off. All the memory of the life of that computer is in it, stored there. Now, if by chance that computer is destroyed where the random access memory is destroyed, then there is no memory of anything that computer has done since its making. Our first en uh, energizing with, uh, or first energizing with power, the breath of life from which it came from when the body dies. The memory is passed on to all living things and it does still live on. Just another way of looking at what you were talking about. Thanks. That comes from Dave. Yeesh. That's kind of bleak. My mom was cremated, so that's well, part of why I'm not having an experience because I no. s I robbed her of that concept. Here's, I, here's, here's where I'll take umbrage with it, and, and, and sorry here, David. Here's here's where we're going to part ways. Uh, the passage is ashes to ashes, dust to dust in the in the in the passage that you hear at a funeral, um, and and so forth. Um, and there is such a thing as burying the cremains. Uh, my my great aunt is buried with my grandma and and grandpa. Uh, so therefore, that would discount automatically what you're saying. Um, the The fact of the matter is, is that even if you want to go toe to toe with a Catholic, uh, the Pope has even said that uh, burned remains are just fine and are acceptable. And if you want to go one step further, supposedly in, in the beliefs of a Catholic, the Pope is the ear next to God. So uh, the fact of the matter remains is that, uh, you know, a, a burned body has nothing to do with anything. Uh, so really, in, in any religion, it, I, don't think it, it, I don't think it matters whether, how the body is disposed of. Um, I... I honestly don't believe that if you can create a, a miracle of, of remains, you know, if, if we want to if we want to get philosophical about it and, you know, we're not typically religious, you know, if we, we don't dissect religious or, or you know, theolo theologi theology too much here on this program. But if, if you want to break it down, so to speak, if a body is in a grave for so long it's going to get washed out by the seasons. Uh, it's going to decompose to the point where there's almost nothing left. Uh, what's the point between, you know, basically what becomes dirt, worm food, uh, and, and ash? The, the, the basic composition is almost nothing. Um, so th there's, that, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fault to that if you want to talk about scientifically the difference between a burnt body and a decomposed body. There, there's, there's almost no difference. Uh, so the fault there is quite a bit. And if, if let's say, you know, let's, well, let's here's an article. If this helps you as well, it's uh, <clears throat> written on a uh, religious uh, site and it goes into it. It says is ashes to ashes mentioned in the Bible. Although it sounds like a Bible verse and is often assumed to be one, the exact phrase ashes to ashes, dust to dust is found nowhere. In no, the Bible. It, it isn't. It's just part it of, is. Right. It says it is, however, derived major biblical themes that can also be found in several passages in Scripture. Uh, Genesis says that God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed life into his nostrils and breath of life, and right. the man becoming a living creature. Genesis 3.19 mentions, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That's why I said in the, in the right. service, in the funeral service, they say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It is not in the Bible per se, it's in the funeral service, and that's where we get it from. Um. But the the fact of the matter remains is that if if God or Jesus or whoever it is you believe in is going to come down and perform some sort of miracle where they reanimate a body, it doesn't matter if it's going to be out of ash or if it's going to be out of dirt or out of a out of a decomposed body. There's going to be some sort of miracle that's going to take place that's going to reanimate a body out of nothing. So does it matter if it's ash or if it's dirt? I don't think it does. Right? Yeah. I, I don't know. I hope not. I don't, I don't think know. I know I there don't... was a lot of 
there was a lot of uh, controversy growing up, and I went to a Lutheran grade school where they talked about it, you know, that you're not supposed to have uh, an autopsy in the sense where they remove the body parts because you were supposed to remain in state the way you died so that you could be resurrected. But again, like you said, if, if we're going to buy into the magic of that theology, then it, it, so that he can resurrect anybody unless this occurs, I don't know. Well, that, that's weird. that's the same as as, as uh, organ donation. You know, it's not like it's not like uh, let's say Jesus comes down and it's and I'm just going to use Jesus as an example. Not that it's we're we're picking one deity over another. Uh, Jesus comes down. He's going to you know reincarnate uh, or, or or resurrect um, all the bodies on earth and and everyone's going to rise up and he goes whoop you donated a kidney. Sorry there, Steve. You're not coming up. Right. You know, it's it's not like someone did a a, a gracious and, and kind act and all of a sudden they're going to get punished for it because, well, you know what, you, you donated your eyeballs and your heart. You know, I don't think that that's going to count against you. I really well, don't. Well, here's the, the thing that, you know, if you're going to follow through on the Bible, I mean, it kind of gives it this, you know, they say that he created man from the earth, right? Right. The physical form, but he then breathed life right. into that form, right. which is the soul, right? Yes. That's where the soul comes in. So the concept then is the physical form will return to the earth from the ashes to the ashes, from the dirt to the dirt, right? That kind of, that kind of philosophy. But the soul is something that transcends it as its own life entity. That's the force that God breathes into the people. I don't yeah. know. Well, and the that's, fact, that's what I'm getting from the article here. Right. And the fact that, you know, the you know, the, if 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 you're coming from a, a Catholic perspective, the Pope has already blown that up. I mean, other religious leaders have already blown that up. They've they've okayed organ donation. They've okayed cremation. All of that has pretty much been thrown to the side. So I don't know that David's theory holds a lot of water there. Sorry, sorry, David. We'll agree to disagree on that. One. It's actually from the book of burials. It's not from the Bible. It's just some like yeah, pre-created, right. you know, things for for exactly priests and pastors and uh, religious leaders to read from, but right. that's not actually quotes from the Bible. And it exactly. says that there are a lot of things that are misquoted, like cleansliness is next to godliness. And, right. you know, don't, uh, don't go swimming 30 minutes after you eat lunch. There's that's that not one. part of the Bible. No, yeah. no, it's not. Uh, yeah. That, that one in, in, you know, always, always uh, uh, rub salt uh, on a wound. Is that one? No, no, no. I don't think anybody ever says always rub salt in a wound. That's that sounds, not it. No, that's counterproductive. I get, um, I get that one confused. Yeah. yeah. Here's another email. How does this one start? Uh, Dave and Tim. Dave. Jeez. I have to tell you, you almost killed me with the parish share episode a few weeks ago. As I'm working, I'm a steel drum manufacturer and tuner, which means I work with electronic equipment and mallets. I sat back and took a nice big swig of coffee at the exact same time. You were reading an email, which had a grammar issue. You then described the grammar issue as an accidental journey into freeform jazz and immediately went into character. This forced a reaction from me, causing a spraying effect from my freshly coffee-filled mouth onto my iPad, which has a tuning app I use and sits on a stand in front of me. As I quickly reached for the iPad, I bumped the stand, thus causing the pad to fall onto a mallet sitting on my turntable or tuning table, flicking the mallet up and directly into my eye. Ooh. What is this guy setting up like a, uh, a, a Wile E. Coyote trap to catch a road runner? <laughs> <laughs> he spits the coffee on the iPad. iPad falls onto the uh, tuning table. Tuning table throws the mallet up into his eye. This forced me to push back in my chair, causing it to roll backwards, delivering the back of my skull directly into the corner of a shelf I have behind me. My son, being in remote lear uh, learning currently, witnessed the event, walks into my office and says, my God, Dave killed you. Mind you, I was still hysterically laughing. Later in that episode, you read an email from a guy who thanked you for the comedy, as I do. And I had a thought. It's, I know it's a paranormal show, but it might be fun to have one show of hilarity from the past. As Tim continues to put together the archives of past shows, and as people listen to them, maybe you can ask them to email you their favorite funny moments, which episode, and maybe timestamps. Just an idea, something I think people would really enjoy listening to in the future. Hope all is well with you. Thanks again for the great show you guys put together, and I'll send you my medical bill. That comes from Matt. <laughs> Matt, it is my pleasure to damn near kill you with our humor. 
Uh, yeah, Tim, I think people should send you the timestamps, the episodes so that you can, uh, on top of all of the other editing you're doing, can go back and find all of those clips of my hilarity and piece them together, Tim. Yeah. Well, as long as there's episodes and timestamps, not just, do you remember that time that when that, and yeah, (laughs) go find that. Yeah. Right now it's a good idea, Matt, and I'm not opposed to it. I'm not against it as they say up in the Hills, but Tim right now is uh, feverishly trying to edit old episodes um, so that they can be put up so we can start airing seasons three, four, and five of Darkness Radio, uh, plus all of our concurrent episodes. So he is currently working on on keeping up with that, throwing him a few more gems here and there to go back and start editing and pulling. It'll be counterproductive to us getting out the past archives, which we've been promising for 15 years. So that's going to be our our main if- uh position right now is just getting out the old episodes if you want to see me in uh, the byline of dumb crime stupid criminals ending up uh, robbing a gas station somewhere just keep throwing stuff at me to do I, yeah, yeah that's all yeah mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's all he's got all right i've got uh, got some more news stories to share okay somebody. yeah uh this question is a good question and uh it says did a scare in jefferson texas actually inspire the movie poltergeist one of, if not the biggest horror movies of the eighties, hands down is poltergeist. The, that's according to this article, mm-hmm. the film directed by Texas chainsaw massacre mastermind, Toby Hooper is one of the biggest critical and commercial successes in horror movie history. Now here's a fun fact about the flick that you may not know. According to local legend, the story of a film and the inspiration to get it made came from a spooky encounter. Steven Spielberg had at the Excelsior hotel in Jefferson, Texas. For those that don't spend a lot of time in Jefferson, Texas, here's a quick rundown. According to those in the paranormal universe, Jefferson is one of the most haunted places in Texas. The history of the place is filled with Wild West shootouts, early 1900 serial killers, and everything in between. So if you're into the paranormal, we would highly recommend the Jefferson Ghost Walk. That's what this article says. Anyway, one of their most famous and popular stories involves famous director Steven Spielberg. Not sure if you've ever heard of him, Tim. No, never have. Young Upstart did a couple movies, one about yeah. a, a shark uh, yeah. being abducted by aliens or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then he did a, a full-length feature uh, movie regarding the TV show Entertainment Tonight. Hmm. E.T. I never watched it. E.T. the movie. Hmm. Eh, it sounds stupid. What um, do you need to see Mary Hart and John Tesh on the big screen? I don't think so. No, I'm sure someday he'll be uh, he'll make something of himself and he'll do something. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. 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 Uh, but anyway, so this young up upstart, uh, Steven Spielberg, according to local legend, was in the area scouting locations for the 1974 film Sugarland Express. After a long day of work, Spielberg and company checked into the Excelsior Hotel in downtown Jefferson. Now, according to the story and legend, Spielberg experienced several unexplained happenings. He was staying in the Gould Room and allegedly tossed his briefcase on a chair, only to have it fly right back at him. There are also reports of bumps in the night and the flickering of lights in the room. Then the kicker. In the late evening early morning a small boy in 1800s clothing woke the director up and asked if he was ready for breakfast spielberg according to the story immediately gathered up his crew checked out of the hotel and got out of town as quickly as possible interestingly enough the excelsior hotel is one of a few places in jefferson that refuses to acknowledge ghosts hauntings or anything of the like however they do promote the fact that many celebrities have stayed at their establishment including Steven Spielberg. Another thing that is known for fact is the idea of poltergeist came from his brain a short time after this supposed haunted trip. And despite not directing the movie himself was super involved in every aspect of the story and production. Now, is there any fact to this legend? Well, one never really knows unless you talk to Steven Spielberg, Tim, but he was in the most haunted town in Texas for a very brief period of time. And pretty soon after that trip, he started pitching the idea that would eventually become one of the most famous ghost movies of all time. Outside of that, we'll leave it up to you, dear listeners, to draw your own. <laughs> now, wait, uh, wait a minute. A ghost. I don't like Poltergeist anymore. Uh, you don't like Poltergeist? Uh, go, uh, time out. All right. So for me, if I'm staying at a hotel and a ghost comes up to me and says, hey, would you like some breakfast? I'm not packing up and running. I'm going, ooh, breakfast. 
Really? <laughs> sure. Uh, let's let's do breakfast. I I concur. Ghost bacon sounds good to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's try it. Maybe less mm -hmm. fattening, less filling. I don't know. All the yeah. great taste, half the calories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. It's weird. Uh, you know, it, it's cool. It's a cool story. I, I guess we'll have to uh, reach out to Mr. What's his name? Sp Spielberg and uh, see if he's willing to come on the show, maybe right, help yeah. promote him so that he gets a little bit more famous. I would hope. Yeah. You would take up our offer. I mean, he needs all the help he can get. Yeah. yeah. He can talk about, uh, the paranormal and the things that have inspired him in yeah. the movies. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Now going back to the movie poltergeist, mm -hmm. I have very fond memories of that movie. That movie scared the bejesus out of me. Um, but, you know, I if you watch it now, it does not hold up. The story does. The special effects and acting are horrible. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And, oh, my Dave Schrader, you idiot. How dare you? I can see the emails coming in already, Tim. No, really. And take take a second happy. look. Take a second look yeah. at it. I mean, you have your memories from the time. Yeah. And when you were much younger and you thought, oh, my gosh, scariest thing I've ever seen. But you probably haven't watched it since then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or or you watched it 10 years ago. Hmm. Yeah. But now since the advent of things like uh, The Conjuring, where yeah. a story takes precedence over everything else. Right. I think you might feel differently. I would have liked when they redid Poltergeist, which it was also a crap movie. Yeah. yeah. I would have liked I would have liked uh, Blumhouse to take that on. Yes. Yeah. And see what they could have done done with the story i still like the original series in my heart and in my mind but i won't spend time rewatching them i've, I've watched them all about four or five years ago mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i was like oh god what what about this did i like this is so horribly acted and campy and and the effects are just so and that's kind of some of the issues I have with the original Ghostbusters. Oh my God. Could you hear the collective? <gasps> oh yeah. Well, yeah. But the special effects don't hold up today. Unfortunately. No, they don't No. It's just like, I love King Kong Godzilla movies. The original movies, watching them today are hard to swallow because you're, yeah. we're used to so much better now. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So especially in the new yeah. trailer. I mean, Ooh yeah. Ooh yeah. Uh, our buddy, George Knapp, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Out of, um, Las Vegas, mm -hmm. he has uh, written an article. This is pretty interesting, something I was uh, unfamiliar with. Is there life after death? A businessman is offering near-million-dollar prize to find out. Is there credible evidence to support the existence of an afterlife? Well, a Las Vegas businessman says he will spend a million dollars to find out. Las Vegas space entrepreneur Robert Bigelow, known for his funding of UFO research projects, has launched a new project. Did he become rich um, when he was a wrestler uh, under the name Bam Bam Bigelow, Tim? Is that uh, how he got his start? Unfortunately, uh, God rest his soul, this is not the same Bigelow. That Bigelow oh. died back in 2007, Dave. Is this Wham Bam Thank You Ma'am Bigelow? <laughs> it may be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, today, the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies announced a global essay contest. BICS is seeking input from scientists, religious scholars, consciousness researchers, and anyone else who can provide evidence of an afterlife. As an incentive, BICS will award $500,000 for the top essay, $300,000 for the second best, and $150,000 for third place. The Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies was formed to try to conduct research and facilitate research into the possibility of the survival of human consciousness beyond bodily death. Bigelow told Mystery Wire in an exclusive interview, and if it's true, then to explore what is the other side all about. In this excerpt from the wide-ranging interview that George Knapp had, Bigelow shared more about the mission of BICS, the roles for the contest, and the current state of research into the survival of human consciousness. Bigelow, the founder and owner of Bigelow Aerospace, as well as the hotel chain Budget Suites of America, has spent millions of dollars to pursue two enduring mysteries. Namely, is there other intelligent life in the universe? He owned the uh, Skinwalker Ranch for a long period of time. 
uh, and whether human consciousness continues after physical death. Now, in the mid-1990s, he created the National Institute for Discovery Sciences, known as NIDS, a think tank and research program which investigated UFO issues as well as survival of consciousness. NIDS was guided by a science advisory board made up of eminent scientists, astronauts, academics, and intelligence officers. And in 2008, a subsidiary of Bigelow Aerospace called the Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, also known as BASS, signed a contract with the Defense Intelligence Agency to investigate UFOs, as well as a wide range of related mysteries. The existence of the secret Pentagon study was made public in 2017. Bigelow told his interest in human consciousness and a possible afterlife was largely the result of personal losses, including the deaths of his father, son, grandson, and wife. He was motivated to find out if his loved ones might still exist in some other reality. In this excerpt from the uh, Mystery Wire interview, Bigelow explained the origins of BICS and why he is prepared to support credible research. Um, and instead of playing that right now, I'm just going to include this link so that you can go hear the uh, couple of interviews with George Knapp and hear them for yourself. Um, I think that would better serve you. Uh, applications are to be submitted by February 28th. The essays, 25,000 words or less, are due by August 1st. The winners will be chosen um, by the end of the year, and the prize is awarded thereafter. Uh, Robert Bigelow rarely grants interviews, has never answered questions on the record about the BAS or DIA study. However, he opened up to Mystery Wire about his UFO investigations, his ownership of Skinwalker Ranch, his interactions with UFO whistleblower Bob Lazar, and many other subjects. Interview segments regarding those topics will be released by Mystery Wire. And in the days ahead. So we'll include the link so you can find this story and um, see for yourself the information contained therein. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we've got more of your emails, more of your stories, and more news to share. And remember, we want to hear from you. Give us a call at our Voices from Beyond voicemail, 651-300-4977. It costs you nothing, and you can call in and share your own story of the strange and the supernatural, 651-300-4977. That's the number to call. We'll be back with more and a brand new theater of the mind right after this. Welcome back to the program. We love hearing from you. That's why we read your stories. We play your phone recordings and have created Theater of the Mind. We're going to play a new episode of Theater of the Mind in just a little bit. Tim, shall we continue on with a new story or would you like a personal story from one of the listeners? Hmm. Uh, Let's go a personal story from a listener. That sounds good. All right. So far, you are zero for two. (laughs) <laughs> in guessing the opening. How does this one open, Tim? <laughs> I think you just do this to screw with me, but go ahead. Uh, whatever you want to do. I don't care. Go ahead. No, go ahead. What, what do no, you think? What no, do you think no. this one opens up? No, I want to see because I think we'll hone your skills. Yeah. After a few uh, weeks of this, Tim, I think you're going to mm-hmm. start nailing them. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whatever. So how does mm-hmm. this one open, Tim? Dear Mally. <laughs> ah, close. Hi, Dave and Tim. Mm-hmm. And besides, uh, her name is Mallory. Yeah. If you haven't figured that out. Mm -hmm. I just thought I would drop a few stories about some experiences I've had in the past. I grew up Christian and as a teen, I would from time to time uh, hear my name called when no one was around. I would answer, yes, God, but there was no reply. But when I was 16, I was driving to my girlfriend's house. It was different. It yelled, pull over. I quickly did and a pickup truck came flying around the corner, throwing gravel and would have slammed into me head on had I not pulled over. 20 years later, my son was about 13 and we lived in my great grandmother's house. She had died long before my son was born. He would see shadow people from time to time. And I had the nightly feeling of someone sitting on my bed almost every night. There was also a perpetually cold spot inside the walk-in closet of the living room. One night I was alone in the house fixing a snack in the kitchen, which looked out across the dining area and living room and the closet door. Suddenly I felt a cold, threatening push from the closet door. Setting my knife down calmly, I focused all my energy and attention to the origin and said, no, 
You are no longer welcome here. Leave now. And pushed back. The push stopped and the room warmed up. I checked the cold spot. It was gone. The shadow people and the nightly bedsitter also seemed to stop. I haven't had any other paranormal-ish experiences since then. Thank you for your time. And that comes from Rabbit, Tim. Rabbit, Rabbit. I hate that rabbit. Hmm. Speaking of rabbit, Tim, Mm -hmm. what season is it? Duck season. Rabbit season. Hmm. Yeah, it's not either, it turns out, Tim. It's deer season. Oklahoma representative introduces a bill to create a Bigfoot hunting season. Rabbit season. It's going to be Sasquatch season instead, Tim. There's a hunting season, and then there's Bigfoot hunting season in the Sooner State. On Wednesday, Representative Justin Humphrey, a uh, Republican, introduced House Bill 1648, urging the Oklahoma Wildlife Conservative Commission, the OWCC, to establish a Bigfoot hunting season. The Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation Commission shall uh, promulgate rules establishing a Bigfoot hunting season, the bill states. The commission shall set annual season dates and create any necessary specific hunting licenses and fees. It is a real bill. Yes, Micah Holmes, Assistant Chief of the Information and Education Division at the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, confirmed to Fox News on Thursday. Real or not, there may be a lack of support from the Department of Wildlife Conservation. Here at the department, we use science to make management decisions, and we do not recognize Bigfoot as a wildlife species in Oklahoma, said Holmes. If it is indeed passed, the act would take effect November 1st, 2021. Before that can happen, however, the Oklahoma legislature will meet on February 1st. Humphreys, uh, or Humphrey represents District 19, a southeastern area of Oklahoma famous for its Bigfoot sightings. According to Fox 25, in nearby Honobia, 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 I don't know how to say this town, Tim, H-O-N-O-B-I-A, Honobia? It could be Honobia. Fans of lore and legend even celebrate the mythical creature with an official Bigfoot festival and conference, which was canceled in 2020 due to the coronavirus. A representative for uh, a representative for Representative Humphrey's office was not immediately available to comment on the bill as presented. Huh. That's uh, that's crazy. Here's my fear with it. You're going to give a license. This this is the theoretic side of it. You're going to give a license somebody to go hunt a Sasquatch. I would tell you this, if you go hunting without blaze orange, and if you have long hair and do not tuck it up underneath your hat, I think it's an anything goes scenario, Tim. People are going to be shooting and making bad, bad choices when you're looking for a bipedal humanoid creature, and they're going to be jumpy. Well, and and depending on what time of the year you're sending people out into the woods to go shooting at each other, um, Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're crossing over between duck season or deer season or whenever you're sending people out, um, you know you're you're sending people out in a legitimate season where you could be having people who are shooting at the slightest crack of a twig at legitimate hunters who are using uh, you know gun safety and and are actually observing certain rules and laws of, of hunting, um, you know, which you're endangering lives at that point because you know, you're going to have every, and, and not that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm casting a a wide net on, on all people who are out there hunting Bigfoot, but you're going to have a a fair amount of crackpots who are out there just toting a gun and, and wanting to take a shot at whatever moves. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's setting up a dangerous precedent. Um, I agree. Yeah. I just, but yeah. part of that story now is that the, the lawmaker who introduced that law also said that there's a fair amount of conservation meant for this bill as well. And that he was hoping that people wouldn't go out and just shoot Bigfoot, that they would go out and find Bigfoot and in that allow it to be recognized as a real species. And that, they would be able to tag it from that point forward and be able to keep tabs on it, not just go out and hunt Bigfoot and kill it. That that the idea was to really recognize that Bigfoot's a real species. Yeah. Um, so I yeah, mean, when you put the term hunting 
on it, that gives a different perspective. It does, but you know, or perception. Yeah, there's there's two sides to hunting. There's you know there's the there's the sporting part of it, which people don't really see, and then there's the conservation side of of hunting, um, which people who are anti hunting don't really think of. Um, and yeah, they, they deer think, population. There's yeah. not enough food to go around. You're out hunting the deer. You're actually helping the other parts of the species. I get, I get a lot of that aspects. But, yeah, uh, the, there is a, you know, there is, there, are, there are benefits to the popu- population being thinned um, because if you didn't do it, there's, there's a pestilence that goes around and, and it affects other populations um, that you know wouldn't be picked up by other predators. You know, other predators wouldn't necessarily feed on that population. Um, so, but you know, is there really anything out there hunting Bigfoot? If, if Bigfoot really is a species, that's the thing you can't argue in a, in a, in, uh, in Senate chambers or, or anything like that, that, you know, there's, there should be a, a greater populace such as us hunting Bigfoot because it needs to be thinned out. I don't know. You know, it's it's kind of a ridiculous argument. I'm more of a pacifist. Maybe what I'll do is I'll set up a nice picnic lunch and I'll get a T-shirt that says free Sasquatch hugs so that, you know, I can entice him out with a, a nicely prepared meal oh, and mm-hmm. uh, a hug. Well, COVID you know, really hug. I'll wear a mask. I feel like through all the through all the Bigfoot shows that have been on TV that you could just nail anything to a tree and they'd come out and then you just hug them. Yeah, you know, you not, uh, Put a rack of ribs well, on the tree. You can't just do that. Like you can't just sneak up on them because you have to have their uh, approval. That's why I would put it in writing. Uh, so if they approach me, they're you know they're obviously they're cool with me hugging them. I don't have this like I oh I just go give them a hug and he's like hey bad touch bad touch but bad how, human. How do you know right. they read English, dude? They've been around for millennia. By now they're reading English. Trust me. Yeah, but that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty grandiose. They must be heavy in the uh, uh, stock markets, too, to be able to afford to keep themselves hidden so stealthily. Well, it's pretty grandiose. No, well, they're hunter-gatherers. I mean, that's how they that's how they get along. I mean, you, you can't just assume that, you know, they're out there, you know, buying stuff at the grocery store all the time. But it's pretty grandiose to think that, hey, they just read English. Maybe they've made up their own language and they have their own support system. And they, they, they look at your T-shirt and you think, hey, they know what fr- free Sasquatch hugs means. But maybe they look at it and all they see is a bunch of gibberish. And they just think you they, understand they're going to see coming that out. on my shirt. And then I'm going to be standing there with my arms extended in an embrace, a loving embrace. Meanwhile, a nice picnic lunch behind me. I think I'm giving them, I'm conveying them the message, Tim, that Which I'm all about hugs. You think means something, yeah. but they think it could mean that you want to wrestle for this prize over here. Yeah. And they come and just, you know, tie up in a pretzel and then steal your lunch and then they leave. See, I'm, I'm the kind, folks, when I see a lemon, I, I'm going to make lemonade. Tim sees uh, a lemon no, and thinks, who the hell gave me a lemon? No, it's, it at you. you know, it's it's the same with these people who think they can pet tigers and tigers want to be petted. Tigers don't want to be petted. Tigers are the king of the jungle. And if they, they want, didn't want to be petted, they wouldn't be born so cute, Tim. No, they, they want to eat mm-hmm. and they, they want to eat, they want to defecate, and they want to run. That's all they want what? to do. Kind of sounds like me, Tim. Are you calling me a tiger? And they want to, you know, and if something gets in their way, they want to fight. They don't want to be petted. Machine Gun Kelly is weighing in, Tim, this week because everybody was wondering what Machine Gun Kelly thinks about life. I know I do. Machine Gun Kelly calls Earth the best reality show for aliens. He's been watching South Park. Yeah. Machine Gun Kelly and his girlfriend, Megan Fox, had an instant connection upon first meeting in March, which has only grown as they bond over their unique beliefs. During his appearance on Tuesday's episode of The Late Show, uh, The Late Late Show with James Corden, the 30-year-old rapper opened up about being a believer in life on other planets, just like the Transformers actress, who's now 34 years old. I saw life on this planet that was from another planet two nights ago over a lake in Thousand Oaks, he said, before describing a red orb that appeared and then just vanished. He continued, a red orb came out of nowhere, went, and then disappeared again. Additionally, the star detailed another extraterrestrial encounter, which included seeing a blue orb over the Pacific in Bora Bora, one week before reports of similar mysterious objects uh, crashed into the sea near Hawaii. They're out there. They're all looking at Earth like, you guys are so Dumb, he mused while promoting his new single, <laughs> Concert for Aliens. 
Everything we're doing the past year is so dumb. He went on to describe Earth as the best reality show for anyone not living on it. While many would dismiss his theories about UFOs or extraterrestrial life, Fox has publicly admitted to believing in everything from Bigfoot to ghosts for years now. So I'm one of those people, he says, who thinks if aliens are real, when they come back to Earth, I'm one of the humans they'll contact. It's me. I know it's going to be me. Mm -hmm. I've always had that feeling. That's Mm -hmm. what Megan Fox actually said. They left Uh out a sentence here back in Cosmo in 2014. That same year, uh, Megan Fox also told MTV a ghost poured her phantom coffee at a hotel in Mexico City while uh, with her eldest child and nanny. I can't explain to you why they're making those sounds, she recalled, of the strange paranormal activity. When the host called her beliefs outlandish, she insisted that the existence of aliens and Bigfoot was more than plausible. If they're a more advanced species, why would we be able to find them if they don't want to be found, the beauty asked, while confirming that she believes in UFOs 1,000%. Additionally, while in her mid-20s, she defended her fairy-based belief system, which also included believing in leprechauns. We should all believe in leprechauns, she told Esquire. I'm a believer. I believe in all of the stuff like this. I like believing. She's a big believer in believing, Tim. I see that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Megan Fox did, however, clarify she was talking about the Lucky Charms leprechauns, but ones in a more traditional sense. That's what she believes in. So she doesn't believe in Lucky, the Lucky Charms leprechaun, but she believes in, I want me gold leprechauns, Tim. Uh, I believe in Lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that this stuff came from somewhere other than people's imaginations. You and I are humans. This is not all of it. This cannot be because we're so disappointing, the mother of three noted. I believe in aliens. I'm childlike in my spirit, and I want to believe in fairy tales. Loch Ness Monster, there's something to it. They are my celebrities. At the time, Fox also said she loved watching the History Channel's Ancient Aliens, which posits theories of past human extraterrestrial contact. So in case you were wondering, sitting there at home today, scratching your head thinking, gosh, what does Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox think about the paranormal? You Mm -hmm. have the answers now, Tim. You know, I actually, last week I was sitting around uh, with my five-minute break that I had, and I thought to myself, you know, I wonder what Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox think about the paranormal. And now you've answered it for me, and and I I don't have anything to think about on my five-minute break now. It's, uh, you know, it's it's like I'm in your head. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a too. little disappointed in Megan Fox that she doesn't believe in Lucky, the uh, the leprechaun from the Lucky Charms uh, commercials. Uh, I think if you're going to believe, man, just go all the way. Go all right. the way, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How does this email begin, Tim? <sighs> uh, dear, uh, dear Hans the dog. Um, no. But it does address his owner. Hi, Dave. Uh, That's me. See. Big fan for years. Love your balanced approach to the paranormal. I'm looking for a little help to see if something is truly going on in our 2017 home. Maybe someone who could remotely view our house and or our family. We moved in last year, an amazing country home on a pond, our final home. We had little things at our past house, but here in our new house, there are a few more things. What concerns us is that it has progressed from weird little things. Young girls' voices saying, Mom, it woke my wife up, and I was awake to hear it also. A month ago, my wife, who doesn't want to see things, watched our recliner fully rocking back and forth before coming to a stop. Last was a progression I wasn't ready for. I had my hip pushed to wake me up. Naturally, I thought it was one of my two kids. I laid flat on my back to see no one. I sat there for a couple of minutes trying to get my bearings. That's when, as if I'm saying I'm here pushed my... Good grief. That (laughs) when, as if saying I'm here pushed my middle big toe backward on my foot. I didn't react. I froze. I finally went back to sleep after 45 minutes of debunking in my head. There is other things that have happened, but can debunk or maybe just in our minds. Nothing has ever been full. uh, Nothing has ever been or felt malicious. It feels more like uh, it's saying I'm here 
We never had acknowledged any of these moments. I have no problem with these things, but touching is too much. And we have children we worry about. It's affecting our dreams, our sleep, and our attitudes. Over the last year, sleeping has been harder and harder for me. We would like to know if someone can help us understand who or what we're working with. We live down by Northfield. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, Shannon, I'm going to give some advice. I'm, I'm getting a lot of emails like this on social media and in my email box. Househealing.com. Check out Househealing.com. David Franklin Farkas has an actual service, uh, and he might be able to help you with that. Um, he has been a guest of ours in the past and has helped many people clear their homes of energy. Uh, he is so proficient at it. I guess he works with many realtors around the United States. So Househealing.com. Uh, you could also reach out to um, uh, the Bodines here in the Twin Cities, uh, Echo Bodine or Michael Bodine, the Ghostbusters. They uh, are, are sensitives, mediums, uh, psychics. They could probably connect with the spirit and find out what's going on and try to help the spirit uh, leave. Uh, so those are some of the aspects. Otherwise, talking out loud to them and sometimes just saying you're, you're making us uncomfortable, unnerving us and frightening us, please leave. Sometimes that's enough to jar things and change it as well. So those would be my first uh, concepts that I would throw your way. How about that, Tim? You like that? Was that good? Yeah. 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 Just giving a little insight from uh, inside the Dave's mind, which can oftentimes be a scary and cobwebby place, Tim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Gosh, where do we go? Uh, speaking of a weird place, Tim, a woman who just won a $60 million lottery said she got the winning numbers from her husband's dream. $60 million. Deng Protadvaram followed her husband's dream all the way to Easy Street. Pravadaram, 57, has played the lottery for two decades using a set of numbers that her husband dreamed about 20 years ago. In December, his dream became reality when his wife played those numbers and won a $60 million jackpot. Ontario Lottery and Gaming said in a news release Monday. On December 1st, the mother of two, who has laid off during the pandemic, went to the bank to pay some bills while her husband checked the tickets. When they returned to the car, he told her they had won Sixty million dollars. I was ecstatically happy. I was crying at the same time. I couldn't believe it at first. Prophet Adam said during a virtual celebration where she was presented the check. I am going to buy a house. Then if it's allowed after COVID, I am going to travel the world. Prophet Adam emigrated from Laos to Canada with her 14 siblings in 1980. For decades, she and her husband have worked hard to support their family, she said. My family was sponsored by a local church, and because we had nothing, I am thankful for the great support they provided us over the years. She said, my husband and I have worked long hours as general laborers for 40 years, trying to save what we could for our family. Due to the pandemic, I was laid off last spring, so the money will certainly help make our lives so much easier. Along with buying herself some diamonds, Pravadatam and her husband will first pay off their bills and help their children who she says are overwhelmed with joy for their parents. They said, Mom and Dad, you've worked so hard for 40 years and made so many sacrifices. You deserve this happiness, Provadatum said. They're also rubbing their filthy little hands together saying, Yeah, we just came into one hell of... Uh, what's that thing called, Tim, at the end of your life? You, know, you get that uh, dowry? Is that what it is? Inheritance? That's it, perhaps. In inheritance, yeah. Dowry is what yeah. you pay in order to marry somebody. Um, you know, yeah. uh, I, I have a, I have a, a, a bit of a, uh, I don't know, a bit of a umbrage with the, the, um, you're the, unruly I, today. I am. I am a little, mm -hmm. a little ticked off at life. Um, you know, we had two big jackpots that came up with the uh, mega millions and, and Powerball over the last uh, week or so. And both of them were one, but you, you keep hearing on the news how impossible the odds are. Uh -huh. And generally, it's like one in three hundred and twenty million. They tell you the the chances. In fact, that they were the the latest Powerball was was it was almost a billion dollars. I think it was a billion dollars. And they told you your chances were one in three hundred and twenty million. And this is they told you how impossible the odds are. Now get ready for this. If you were to drive from Minnesota to Guadalajara, Mexico, and back again. They said it would be like you picking the lucky inch of that mile. 
between Minnesota and Guadalajara, Mexico, those are your chances of winning the Powerball that night of a billion dollars. Yet, somebody won. Okay. Now, it seems to me that somebody wins the Powerball jackpot eh, maybe, you know, three, four times a year, right? And somebody wins the Mega Millions jackpot three, four times a year. So are the odds really one in 320 million? Well, sure. Just so happens that you happen to be number 12 this time. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, it's, it's, yeah, I, I get your point. But, I uh, don't know that the odds are that big. I, I just, uh, I just don't. And then you hear of multiple winners, you know? So I, I, I don't, I don't know that the odds are, are what they say they are. I think they just, put them out that much to drive sales. So I, I, I you know, I, I just think How come it's, it's always somebody uh, like 55 or older that wins too? Well, because the, that tends to be <laughs> the, the people who put out not only the most money on, on tickets, but they tend to be the ones who, who play the game the most too. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's always the ones that they're probably not going to have to pay out the full amount to. <laughs> It's, I'm just. I'm so, I don't mean to sound a little cynical. I'm pulling my Tim out, if you don't mind. But uh, I kind of get that your vibe Tim too. Out, hey, no. Yeah. Uh, but you know the 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 other thing too, like the the it's funny the where the where the winners actually are where they where they're located. You know, you have not every state in the nation participates, like say in Powerball, but most of them do. But the the winner of the Powerball was in I think Novi, Michigan, this time. The winner of the Mega Millions was actually out east, I think, in one of the eastern states, like Vermont or something like that, or New Hampshire. It was it was one of the East Coast states. Um, and the, the winner of the Mega Millions always seems to be out on the East Coast somewhere, New York, New Jersey. Uh, it never comes this far west. You never hear somebody winning a multi-million dollar jackpot uh, on the West Coast or, or even in the Midwest. Um, we also got to look at the fact this woman, this guy had a dream 20 years ago. She's played it every day since. Right. No, it's no, a no, lot right. of chances right. in there. So, you know, I mean, it's just eventually that number paid off. I've, I've often wondered and I've, I've put out numbers and then all of a sudden I see it hit and I'm like, damn it. Why didn't I, if I, what would it have taken, you know, it's mm-hmm. 365 bucks this year. And I might've won 10 grand just by playing that dollar ticket for that number that I, I kept seeing. That's true. And you, you sit there and kick your ass about it, but that's the problem. That's exactly what they want you to feel. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, and they, you know, you've seen the ad campaign. You you can't win if you don't play. You know that 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 I don't remember which game put that ad campaign out years ago. You know they they put the subliminal. I think it was Monopoly. No, no, no. There was an actual lottery yeah. lottery game. I don't remember if it was Power. I think it was Powerball that put that out. You can't win if you don't play. Um, but the commission put that. You know, put that uh, slogan out there. You know, they they put little things out there to, you know, drum up interest or whatever. Um, But, you know, you want to talk about testing psychic ability um, and all that, all that other stuff. I've actually won a hundred dollars at Powerball 10 times. Yeah. How many do you have to have right to get 100 bucks? You have to have five numbers. Correct. Out of how many? Oh no! Is it is it four? No, it's five, I think it's four numbers. Is it four numbers or five numbers? No, no, there's there's five numbers plus the Powerball. I think you have to have five. Really? So you could get five of those numbers right and only get a hundred bucks? Yeah, only a hundred bucks. It's, shenanigans. Yeah, but shenanigans. Yeah. So you know, huh. it's kind of like life is like okay, we're setting the hook. We're setting the hook. Come on and play again. <laughs> Come on and play again. Good grief. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 nuts. So that's that's the kind of thing that keeps you coming back because it's it's very easy at times to and that's why I bring this up. That's that's what's so maddening about the game and, and why I say, is it really one in three hundred and twenty million? That's why I'm kind of coming around full circle on this conversation. Mm. Uh because it seems pretty easy to me, and maybe it's not for other people because I've heard other people say, well, I've played before and I don't win like that, but how often do you play? And yeah. and when have you played and how much have you played? Because for me... Uh, All right, fine, Tim. I'll go invest every time and play. No, no, Jeez. no, no, no. no. It's, 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 it's not How long like have you been working for the lottery commission, Tim? Well, for... You and your high-pressure tactics? F- 15 years now. Um, but no, it's, uh, you know, 
it just to me, and I don't play that often. I only play when the jackpots get real high. So, just saying. Well, that's Tim. He likes to play when he's high. Uh, mm -hmm. Australian woman is horrified to find an intruder living in her roof for three weeks. Suspecting paranormal activity in one's house is enough to give somebody the creeps, Tim, obviously. However, if one finds out that the one moving things around is not a ghost, but turns out to be a complete stranger living right under their roof, that's much more shocking. Monica Green, a mother in Rockhampton in Queensland, Australia, started noticing that her things at home would end up in different places other than where she remembers she had left them. While it may have been attributed to mere full get for mere full or doesn't want to come out of my mouth. While it may have been attributed to mere forgetfulness, what made her more anxious was when she discovered that her security camera at home had been disabled. New York Post stated that when uh, what set Green off was a day when she came home and saw that things were in disarray. She narrated that the back door was open, the air conditioning was on, and that there was a half-cooked meal of chicken nuggets. All these told her that something was terribly wrong in the home. Any one of those would have been sending off signals in my skull, Tim, but it took all three for her to figure this <laughs> out. When the police came, they discovered that the attic door in the ceiling had been left ajar. The horrified mom described the whole ordeal as something akin to a horror film. Why was he in the roof? What were his intentions? Was he here to harm us? Was he here to steal one of my kids, said Green in news.com AU. He also expressed concern, or she also expressed concern for her kids, whom she said she felt like she has uh, failed, considering that she is supposed to be the one there to protect them. Jason Milner of the Queensland Police stated that the situation at Green's house was a unique one. He also said that it was not a usual occurrence. These intruders would break into their home and enter to steal. I felt violated. I felt like my personal space had been invaded. I felt shocked, terrified, scared, said Green to Courier Mail. She also had a theory on how the intruder was able to enter her home. She believes that they stole her car keys. As of the writing, the identity of the intruder has not yet been established. Queensland authorities are still investigating Green's case. Oh, that's creepy. If you hear things, I, I've got to tell you, we've had some weird stuff happen at my house over and over again. And uh, I've been woken up the last two or three days to the sound of a loud boom. And I wake up and like my wife's still sound asleep. She's a you know, fair sleeper. My dog is sound asleep. None of the kids are moving. And I can't figure out where this booming noise keeps coming from that shocks me awake every day. But it's li literally, I, I thought somebody was like outside and pounded the garage Hulk style once, you know, to get boom. And it was just this whole kind of house rattling noise, but nobody else is hearing it. Now, see, but, but you've had... You've had activity in your house before, though, right? Yeah. See, I I'm going through the same thing too. Like late at night, and it's what time is it at when you when you hear it? It varies. You know, it's been three thirty in the morning. It's been seven in the morning. Right. Okay. So, yeah. like, mine's generally between two and four, and and I hear it, it. But to me, it sounds like either somebody's in the house or either downstairs or upstairs, and I, and I, I hear something kind of like that. It's kind of a boom, or it's kind of a it's, it's either that or it sounds like someone's kind of coming through the door, like adjacent to the garage. But yeah, it, it's, it's similar. It's like a boom or like a, like, a, like a door flinging open from the garage. Something or someone is trying to get yours and my attention. Yeah, it's weird. It, it, but yeah, it's either a boom or a, like it's a boom coming through the, the, the porch or, a, a, yeah, or, or from the garage. It's really weird. Yeah. Well, you've heard our stories. Now it's time for us to share a story with you as we tune into a new theater of the mind. Today's theater of the mind is written by Christian Ashlar from his real experience called Red Cars. On a very hot Monday in late May, my sister Karen came for a visit. She arrived at our house just before 10 in the morning, as was customary in my house. At 12.30, the soap opera, Days of Our Lives, was turned on. My mother's mother, who lived with us, was a tremendous fan and never missed an episode. When she was home, my mother would often sit through an hour of the show. My sister, as many were, was a casual fan, meaning she watched as if she had the opportunity. 
But as a teenaged male, I only had an interest in one of the male leads if they were going to be shirtless. Now, during the commercial breaks, my sister and I had snippets of dialogue that, when taken as a whole, was a complete conversation. I was more than willing to sit through soap opera drama to have this time with my sister. During the show, which was bereft of shirtless men that day, I played with my niece, who had come with my sister that day. When the soap was over, my sister began to collect her things. I did the same thing for the baby, who was not very old at the time. I took her things out to the car, then took my niece out and secured her in the car seat. My sister came out, hugged me and my mother, and drove off. Now, before going back inside, my mother commented on her rose bushes and their need for some extra care. She took a few minutes to pick some weeds out of the flower bed and I decided to help her. We didn't talk much, just focused on the work at hand. Unknown to me, at that time, my sister told my mother she would call when she got home. From our house to hers, the drive would take only about 15 to 20 minutes. If she stopped for groceries or to do errands, it might take 30 minutes. At the most, it would have taken no more than an hour. Because weeding roses led to other outside tasks, my mother and I, we lost track of time. The soap opera was an hour long and my sister left soon after, which made her time of departure around 1.45 p.m., no later than 2 p.m. My mother and I came inside to find out it was almost 4 in the afternoon. Just a few minutes before five, as my mother's mother began to think about what they would prepare for dinner, my mother asked if my sister had called while we were outside. No. I had a function to go with my grandparents, so I went to shower and get ready. My mother began to pace. At around 5.15 p.m., my mother got her purse and walked outside. From the large picture window in our living room, I watched her go down the steps, down the short sidewalk, and around to her car. At the very same time, another car pulls into our driveway and parks behind her. Our house was in a very rural area, so any car coming up the driveway is akin to an event. This car was not special in any other way. A man stepped out of the car that I recognized, and I wondered why he would be at our house. He came over to my mother and faced her. If you know very much about interactions in the southern states, you'll know that this kind of stance is very formal. I knew from this man's carriage he was not there on a social call. He and my mother exchanged words and she began shaking her head. She stepped in and she fell into his arms, while her own stayed at her side. He held her. Then she dropped her purse. This gesture told me something very terrible had happened. I don't say this to be flip. My mother was a very coordinated individual who had juggled a toddler, a grocery list, a wallet, and her purse without losing her grasp on any of those things. This was not a woman who just dropped things. In this moment, in spite of the May heat in the open living room, I felt a sense of being cold and closed in. I also couldn't move. My mother's mother, not my grandmother for many reasons, went outside to see what was going on but I could not move. Inside, I knew I didn't want to. Karen is gone, my mother's mother said when she came inside. Gone? Where? I asked, not understanding. Gone, came the annoyed reply. I didn't find out what gone was until my mother came inside and told me my sister had been killed in a car accident. Here, my recollection gets a bit spotty. Because my sister had children, it was possible my mother left with the man to go attend to them. It was also quite possible my mother called my brother-in-law to see what the situation was. I say this because from this point forward, my memories are very jumbled when it comes to the series of events. I know my grandparents were informed of the incident, but I also know we attended the event as planned. I come from a blended family, and this particular sister was my mother's youngest child from a previous marriage. The grandparents in question were my father's parents. This sister did not grow up with them, nor was she very close to them as I was. They were not callous people, they just thought to give my mother and father some time to process their loss. When I returned from the event, my entire family had gathered. My brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, parents, a few aunts, uncles, cousins, and a smattering of strangers filled our small house. Collective grief never feels quite so stifling than when it's contained to a small, 
rural house. I was never so thankful for an attached patio as I was that evening. While the inside counters began to pile up with condolence dishes, I began to fill up pages of a journal with the events of the day. Three days later, I walked into the funeral home to the same array of people. The service was more than somber. Tears, more tears, and an avalanche of guilt came over me. My niece was fine and was too young to retain any memories of the accident, but I kept wondering if I had put her in the car seat the right way. Had I left a strap undone or a buckle unfastened? Had my sister lost control of the car attempting to right a wrong I had done? Had I, in some innocuous way, contributed to my sister's accident and in turn, her death? I was old enough to drive when this occurred, so I drove to the gravesite alone. All the way there, I thought about my part in the whole thing, and my emotional state deteriorated. At the gravesite, I stood with my brothers and sisters, but I watched my mother and how she seemed to be holding everything together. Yes, she cried, but she was not hysterical. She grieved, but she did not howl and scream the way that I wanted to. What if I had done all of this? The mind of a 16-year-old is not the most stable of places, and this prevailing thought made it even much worse. Later this year, I began a relationship with a young man. As you might imagine, being in a southern state, I had to keep this from my family. Two years into our time together, we began talking about getting married and moving out of the south. The idea my sister would not be there to see this began taking up more and more space in my head. I was living with friends at the time. We enjoyed doing silly things like having mock seances and channeling spirits while doing the dishes or vacuuming the apartment. As you can see, we did not see this as anything other than a game. One night, one of my friend's sisters brought over a Ouija board. My aunt had one when I was younger, and I never got anything from it in spite of how many times I played with it. I even moved it around to say crazy things when my cousins would play it with me. This evening, I thought of how much fun we would have scaring one another with this thing. To amp up the creepiness, we drove out to the middle of nowhere, which is often 10 minutes from your front door when you live in the rural south. This evening, however, we drove 30 minutes and found the farthest back of back roads to play our Ouija game. Everyone sat in the bed of the truck with the board on the bed, four of them crowded in around the board while I and another friend sat watching. I didn't want to participate in this as the mental specter of my sister still surrounded me. A chorus of nightlife also surrounded us. Crickets, night birds, the sound of rustling leaves and the scurrying of various night animals set the musical backdrop. Brad, the sibling of the sister with the board, led the first round of questions. Are you here with us spirits? He asked in his most dramatic voice. Can you show us a sign that you're here? A hard knock on the other side of the truck indicated that my other friend had a sense of humor. For the first few rounds of questions, this is how things transpired. We were there to scare one another. After all, not get any real communication from the other side. I still refused to participate, but I did provide a pivotal question for the board. What's my sister's nickname for me when I was a toddler? Fingers touched the planchette, and again, the only sounds came from the wilderness. An odd sort of tension built between the six of us, and none of us could put a name to it. The planchette did not move. I smiled, knowing the reason. No one knew the answer, and to attempt one would expose them all for the fraud we knew this game to be. Then, the planchette moved. To the letter T. It spun once around, the other letters then returned to T, then to R, then did another small spin. It stopped moving for almost a full minute, then went back to T. Another short spin and we got another T. After this repetitive nonsense, the indicator stopped moving. Ask another question, Brad shouted. It moved by God, for you it moved for real. To humor Brad and not seem like the wet blanket, I asked, Do you have a message for me? Right off, the planchette went to no. We all laughed at this. Then the indicator crept across the board to R. Then to D. Then finished with C-R-S. Brad stood up and announced, We're leaving. 
I was moving it before, but not this time. I felt the thing moving under my fingers. We're freaking leaving. You don't argue with the person driving the vehicle when you're out on the Backwoods County Road in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night in the south. So we put the board in the cab and off we went home. Those of us riding in the back of the truck were unaware that Brad had broken the board into three pieces and thrown each piece out the window at different spots on our way home. Almost two months after the incident with the Ouija board, a female friend and I decided to go to a nightclub and have some fun. I consumed a prohibitive amount of alcohol and was put into the passenger seat. After securing my seatbelt, my female friend began the drive home. Before we could reach home, however, we were involved in a car accident. Deer are prevalent on the back roads and she had to swerve to miss one. In my alcohol-induced state, I had fallen asleep. I woke to find myself wedged in between the seats and being extracted by EMT personnel. The next day, I woke again in the hospital. My parents were there and my friends from my living situation were also there. A few friends from high school stopped by and grandparents came at one point. I told them all the same thing. I had broken my back. What did I know? I was a 16-year-old artist, not a doctor. That was a little Star Trek humor to lighten the mood, which is about to get very, very dark. What I told them was both true and false. I had injured my back, not broken it. My spine was intact, but there was damage that would need to heal. For the next six weeks, I would need to be in bed of some sort and confined there. This meant several things for me. One, I could not see my long-distance boyfriend, nor could we continue forward with any plans for marriage. Two, I would need to move back home with my parents so they could provide me with 24-hour care should I require it. Three, I would have very little to occupy my mind other than the resurgent grief, which had been an almost constant companion now for the last two years. All I saw before me was six weeks or more of mental imprisonment. The time I spent in bed ended up being a full two months and some change. During this time, I thought often about, about my departed sister. I wrote about her, drew things that reminded me of her, talked about her to no one. My mother avoided the topic as it was all still too painful. And it would have been that way almost for a decade as the pain of doing so proved too much. My sister was never far from my thoughts because the grief of her loss was still unprocessed. After I got out of bed, after I was fitted with a brace to help my back continue to heal, I moved in with my grandparents. I began to focus on other things and my mental state improved. One afternoon, I decided to go visit my friends and former roommates. Yes, I had an agenda. When I arrived, they were on edge with me. The longer we talked, the more I could see the topic they were trying to avoid coming into clearer focus. The Ouija board session. Being the direct person I've always been, I said, anyone want to talk about the Ouija board session? Because I sure do. It was freaky, man, Brad said right off. That thing was moving. I swear it was. None of us knew the answer to the question, so none of us moved that damn thing. But damn, if it didn't move on its own. This is how the conversation began and how it continued for a while. One of the five of us was quiet the entire time. She even excused herself a few times during the conversation. She always returned, but she got more and more agitated as things went on. Again, being the direct one, I asked her what had made her so upset about this. Even if someone was moving it, the letters made no sense, I told her. They mean nothing. She took out a piece of paper and wrote down the series of letters. T-T-R, T-T-D-C-R-S. Do you know what they're spelling? Looking at them on paper, I knew what she knew. Vowels, I said, feeling the dread creep in. We begin filling in the spaces and found two heart-stopping messages. The first was my sister's nickname for me as a toddler. Tater Tot. T T R. T T. Because they were all I could eat for a time. Second, no was the beginning of the message, not an answer in itself. No red cars. We sat in silence for several long minutes. None of us knew what to think or say. Brad broke the silence with, you guys had an accident in a red car? My female friend left the room yet again. This time, when she came back in, 
She had a large envelope in her hand. The address of the apartment. The one we were in. The one they still lived in after the accident. Was on the front in big, bold, block letters. She pulled something out of the envelope and tossed it onto the coffee table. It was a piece of the broken, discarded Ouija board. In the lower right-hand corner was Brad's sister's signature. Another awesome story and another great job by Tim. Thank you so much for sending in your stories. Remember, we want to hear from you. If you've got a weird paranormal story and you want to write it as a narrative, it may be featured on an upcoming episode. Try to keep the stories to about three pages long or shorter, and uh, we will take a look at them. And if it's something that we can work in, we will certainly do so. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll air it. I've, I've collected a few more, Tim, that I'll have to forward over to you that will never make air, and I don't don't know if people are just playing games with me or okay. they're really having these kind of filthy, bizarre paranormal experiences, ah. but they're just not ones I feel comfortable releasing on this show. All right. Yeah. Mainly because ah. I don't want to be haunted by what sound effects you'll come up with. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Our next story, a tragic murder leads to bizarre paranormal event in a haunted motel room. We've all heard of the kind of ghost stories that you tell around a campfire, but have you ever encountered a real-life paranormal event? While many out there might say that they don't believe in ghosts or spirits, others swear by their experiences of the spooky and inexplicable. One such man was able to catch a terrifying phenomenon on his own camera phone, as shown in Paranormal Caught on Camera, which you can watch on nine now i don't know where this is coming from it's from the au but i'll include a link to the story as well frank ramirez a texan who was traveling for business decided to check into a motel to stay the night when something truly bizarre occurred in his room i decided to turn on my camera because there's something really scary going on in here right now ramirez says in a camera video that has since gone viral and appeared on paranormal caught on camera one of these cups right here he says, pointing towards a bathroom sink, fell onto the floor. That phone fell off its cradle, and I have no idea why. Oh, yeah, this is old footage. I think we covered this when it first happened way back in the day. Now it's appearing on Paranormal Caught on Film. While the footage may sound innocuous at first, Ramirez continues to film and catches a ghostly phenomena that plays out in front of all of our eyes. Suddenly, the phone that Ramirez had just pointed out to flings itself off the cradle towards the man in a violent jerking motion and clatters across the desk, moved by a completely unseen force. I can't figure out what's going on, and it's happened a couple of times, added uh, Ramirez. Paranormal investigator Susan Slaughter appeared on Paranormal Caught on Camera to discuss the event, saying there's a lot of mental energy going on in a hotel. You could have someone going there to have a romantic evening with a partner or something even more sinister. Brian Kano, another paranormal investigator, weighed in on the situation as well, perhaps lending an explanation to what was occurring in the seemingly haunted room. Just as we leave little physical bits of ourselves everywhere we go, we also leave behind an emotional energy. Hotels and motels have a very strong footprint in these areas because they represent something that is very much outside of our daily routine, he said. For the past eight years, I had been going and staying at that motel. When I first got into the room, I looked at the phone and it was off the cradle. I put it back on and then it popped off again, Ramirez explained. I couldn't believe what I was uh, seeing, so I started filming it. But it turns out that the emotional footprint left in this particular motel room was one of a very tragic and terrifying incident that happened in its recent history. After Ramirez's footage of the paranormal occurrences were viral online, he was contacted by a couple who said that their daughter had been murdered in that very same room back in 1989, and the suspect was never convicted. That's terrifying. Yeah. It's sad. Boy, I hope somebody goes to that room to try to do a blessing, like the family goes there to help this girl try to cross over. Mm -hmm. Oh, it just gives me the shivers. Not the good shivers either, Tim. The kind no. of, ugh, yeah. I don't like those. Yeah. Yeah. Brr. Creepy stuff. Uh, hey, I just wanted to touch base with the fact that um, this week is a little bit different. I, I think you've noticed it. Uh, we flip-flop days, and that was because yesterday was Holocaust Awareness Day, and our guest had a story that kind of tied into that, so we wanted to um, 
kind of memorialize that day and then spend some time with you here. Uh, today, uh, of course, being Thursday, you're getting Supernatural News Parashare. Tomorrow is a brand new episode of Holzer's Ghosts. We're going to be going and taking a look at episode four. And uh, this is uh, Holzer Files episode four, season one. And it's a, a chilling story. It is the devil in Texas. This was a story that really impacted me um, and certainly impacted Hans Holzer and the family that he tried to help. Not only do we take an old story, but we're able to help somebody in a current situation uh, dealing with a similar type phenomena. So we go with the team to investigate it. My special guest Thursday night on my live stream on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook and social media platforms is uh, Reverend Bill Bean. He'll be joining me to discuss because he was our special guest on that episode. We're going to discuss possessions, hauntings, <clears throat> and the different things that he's had to deal with. So that's all this Thursday on a brand new live stream of Holzer's Ghosts presented by Darkness Radio. Friday, you'll be able to tune in and hear the audio version of that podcast right here where you listen to all of the best in paranormal talk radio. I will be out filming all next week, but we have new episodes for you. We just will not be doing a Holzer's Ghosts episode next week as I will be out of town uh, filming for a, a very cool special. And I can't give any more information than that, sadly, Tim. Uh-huh. Yeah, kind of mysterious. You like mysteries, don't you? I do, especially Scooby Doo mysteries. Those were the best. Oh, like Zoinks, man. Yeah. 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 Cool stuff. Mm-hmm. All right, let's see. Uh, what other crazy, weird stories? Uh, oh, how about this? Talking about possessions, which is nine tenths of the law, as I remember from childhood. It was. A, paran- a paranormal investigator has been possessed by a nasty pub ghost who came through the dance floor portal. Dance floor portal. That sounds like a, a sting album from the early nineties, doesn't it? It was coming through the dance floor portal was right after dream of the blue turtles. If I remember yes. right. Yeah. yeah. You are correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see how this unfolds. A paranormal investigator has told the bizarre tale of how he ended up possessed by a nasty ghost who he believes crossed over to our world from a portal in the dance floor of a pub. The team of ghost hunters called the Gloucester paranormal investigative service is, uh, have detailed some of their 2020 visits and they have uh, led to some unwanted guests, including one spirit called Albert Manning, who can be uh, found at HMP Gloucester. Albert and the team have developed a relationship uh, with the team over the course of their two and a half year investigation at the site. And the team adding, he often gives them intelligent responses to questions. GPIS lead investigator Ed Francis said it took a lot of time to carry out investigations, detail the evidence, and profile the spirits we have come across. In all, it took two and a half years of investigating at that prison. It was a real breakthrough when we were able to name one of the spirits being Albert Manning, who we discovered was buried on the grounds of the prison after being hanged there. The team had researched Manning and discovered he had shot his lover and was executed for the murder back in 1883. GPS or GPIS pride themselves on being able to determine, uh, having carried out previous investigations, which spirit is engaging with the paranormal investigating equipment. During investigations of the prison, they believe they have come across a female prison warden spirit who they hope to find out more about. Ed said, we have been able to place other entities in other places in the prison. We have had a soft voice come through of what we believe is a female prison warden. We will look into this more in the future. This is something we found on a wing, but Albert tends to overpower the spirits as he wants to be heard. He is also quite manipulative and has tried to convince us in the past of him being someone else. They have over 400 hours of video footage to look through and study frame by frame. The team hopes this will reveal more apparitions and ghostly revelations. GPIS lead investigator Paul Calmeadow said Albert Manning's profiling and uh, footage has been our biggest accomplishments yet. Paul also spoke about other unpleasant experiences they had in another investigation at the Gloucester pub. Other paranormal teams do not have the evidence, which we do, as ours is backed with evidence, and we build on what we have experienced and seen. During the pub investigations, we found there seems to be several spirits called John. These names have been mentioned by others in the past and were able to determine there were different characters called John from different time periods. One John was down as being a nasty man who was a chef, when actually he was nasty, just a typical chef. The nasty spirit called John comes up through a portal, which is on the dance floor. 
During the investigation, Paul realized the entity which comes through the portal is very strong and it affected him for nearly a month. Paul said a nasty entity put a very strong attachment on me. We were told uh, there could be a portal on the dance floor and there I put my hand over it not knowing what was going to come through. It took a while to get rid of this man. He added, it was horrible, and I had very bad dreams, and he would mess with my head and visions, and it was very scary, especially when you're trying to fall asleep. I don't mind spirits being in my house, but this one was trying to hurt me, according to that story. I'm looking at some of the pictures and videos here. I don't really see anything that uh, makes it worthy of posting to our site, because there's no actual photographs. Hmm. So, uh, or no video there either. So, uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, some more news stories. I'm just looking through these. There's some uh, bizarre ones. Um, here's one, uh, Tim. Here's one that's kind of a, a parish share and a news story all at once. It's being, re- it's being uh, um, relayed to us from Cool, 107.9 FM, Western Colorado's greatest hits. Good times, great oldies. Cool 108. No. Sure, yeah. We're also in their store online. You can get stings coming up through the portal on the dance floor. So yeah. it's all tied together, really. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. I just had a paranormal experience I can't explain, driving a lonely Michigan back road. That's how this starts off. It's written by Maitland Mossel. I know there are a lot of skeptics out there who will try to tell me what I experienced was unusual, but nothing paranormal. Trust me, my boyfriend still doesn't believe me. However, I feel like there's no other explanation for what happened to me over the weekend. It all started when I went to my boyfriend's aunt's house in rural Michigan to feed her cats while she was out of town. It was dark, but nothing too eerie in the air. I was blaring my music, just vibing and getting ready to play with some cats. Life was good. Once their cats were fed, I hopped back in my car and continued to play my music. This detail is important later. And I headed home. As I turn onto our road, there's a heavily wooded nature preserve, so you usually have to keep your eyes peeled for deer. Well, what I saw zoom across the road was no deer. No, no, it was the size of a deer, but was up in the air about halfway up the tree line. I can hear you now. Jeez, it was probably just a bird. And to that I say, nay, it did not move like a bird. My first thought was, it's a ghost, a demon, a spirit of some sort. Jordan's first thought was that it was an owl. When I got home, took off my coat and shoes and ran inside to tell him what I had seen. As I'm freaking out, telling him my story, trying to convince him that it's not just because I've been watching too much ghost adventures, I go to reach for my phone and it's not in my pocket. I check my coat, purse, car, bed, everywhere. It's not there. I get mad because how do I lose my phone two seconds after walking in the door? Jordan suggested I maybe left it at his aunt's house, but I couldn't have as my music would not have played in my car without it. After a lot of searching, swearing, and thinking a ghost must have moved it, I check my car for the fifth time and find my phone in the side door panel pocket on my passenger side. I immediately get the chills because I knew it was in the coat pocket the whole time I was driving. Also, had my phone fell in there when I braked or turned or what have you, I would have heard it smack into the door and fall into the drawer. All in all, yes, What I saw could have been something living, but with the whole phone situation right after, I have to think it was more paranormal. I told the story on my Instagram story later that night, and a shaman reached out and said he believed me and that he thinks I saw some sort of animal spirit guide, and it was trying to give me a message. What that message would be, I'm not sure, but man, something spiritual or ghostly happened, and there is really no convincing me otherwise, but you can sure try. Wah, wah. Ah. Mm. So that's uh, that's their story, and they're sticking to it, Tim. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Look at that. These are some good stories. I like this. All right. Uh, here we go, Tim. Uh, this is exciting for me, Tim, because I grew up uh, a pepper. Were you a pepper? A, a pepper? Wouldn't you like to be a pepper, too? Tim? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. The Dr. Pepper Museum in Waco is giving those with an interest in the paranormal the chance to tour the facility. According to a report from news partner KWTX, there may be more to the Dr. Pepper Museum than just great cans of soda. The educational experience manager, Rachel Moore, along with other staff members of the museum, have experienced some out-of-the-ordinary happenings. From shadows that you swear disappear right before your eyes to items falling off shelves mysteriously. 
The Dr. Pepper Museum seems to be a hotspot for paranormal activity. The museum has previously held ghost tours around the Halloween season, but with paranormal experiences continuing to occur over the past five years, they've decided to add ghost tours twice a month. The staff is encouraging guests to be their own paranormal investigators and will even provide equipment for you to investigate with, like an EMF reader. Small groups will be led by a tour guide. The museum's lights will be off and the power will be lowered. The ideal atmosphere for finding all things spooky and scary. Moore, who doesn't believe that there's anything evil or dark residing in the building, but simply... Uh, but simply imprints left by those who worked there years ago. That doesn't mean you won't have to sign a waiver, though, because you never know what could happen while you hunt for ghosts in the dark at the Dr. Pepper Museum. If you're down to reach out to this great unknown, you can check for available tour dates by visiting Dr. Pepper's museum website. There's a lot of history in Waco. According to this article, I wouldn't be surprised if there truly were paranormal experiences at that museum. I can't be certain because I've never witnessed anything out of the ordinary during any of the tours at the museum. So kind of a weird story, but uh, if you're a pepper and I'm a pepper and she's a pepper, people would like to be a pepper. They can go on this tour. How can they find more information? I'll put this story up on the news section today at darknessradio.com. Click on that news tab. You can scroll down, find out more information if you would like to visit the Dr. Pepper Haunted Museum. <laughs> Nothing worse than a little soda pop culture, Tim. So, oh, pop culture. God. <laughs> ah, all right, fine. Uh. Jack Osborne to star in Discovery Plus series Fright Club with the Ghost Brothers. Jack Osborne has seen some pretty crazy things as a member of the Osborne family, but he will be seeing ghosts in his next major project, Fright Club. Osborne joined the Ghost Brothers team of Dalen Spratt, Marcus Harvey, and Juwan Mass for the new Paranormal series, which will only be available on the Discovery Plus streaming platform. The first three of 10 episodes will debut on February 9th, with new episodes debuting every Tuesday afterward. In the show, Osborne and the Ghost Brothers will show off the creepiest and craziest paranormal footage they have, uh, you know, found while while researching. The episodes cover UFOs, Bigfoot, and of course, ghosts. They interviewed the eyewitnesses who filmed the footage, as well as psychic mediums, ufologists, cryptozoologists, and other experts to discuss the paranormal disturbances. At the end of each episode, Osborne and the Ghost Brothers vote on the clip that will keep the audiences up at night. In the first episode, Hide Your Kids, Watch the Skies, the hosts compete to scare each other with the footage they discovered. Osborne kicks things off with security camera footage that appears to show a ghost wandering a preschool in an interview with a third-generation Bigfoot hunter who thinks he found real Sasquatch hair. Harvey uh, comes up with an amateur ghost hunter who found surprising footage of a ghost that can crumble solid wood. Spratt, however, found evidence of paranormal activity at a bar while Juwan Mass tries to conquer his own fears. In the end, the group meets with a Florida pastor who shows them spiritual phenomena. Mass heads to the Carolinas in the second episode, Phantom Photobomb, to check out pure camera footage as a harbinger. Uh, that's an episode I believe I'm a part of, as a matter of fact. He also meets a woman who claims to have seen a demonic spirit in the Rockies. Osborne interviews a man who claims to film small UFO drones from his balcony. Elsewhere in the episode, Osborne scares his own co-stars with footage of a knife-throwing ghost. Spratt digs up a video that allegedly shows an evil clown doll breaking up relationships, and he also meets with a guitar shop manager to tell him about the unexplained activities in the store. Lastly, Harvey becomes convinced he has found proof that Bigfoot is real. And the last episode available on February 9th is Astral Vampire Weekend. In this one, Osborne shows footage of New York City's bartenders being attacked by a drunken ghost. He also interviews a woman who claims she can summon UFOs herself. Spratt digs into government footage that might show an Alaskan river monster and shows off alleged Sasquatch recordings. Harvey learns that the spirits can be dangerous when you investigate them, and Mass thinks he saw an astral vampire on camera. Osborne, of course, rose to fame while starring on the Osbournes with his parents, Ozzy and Sharon, and sister Kelly. Since that series ended in 2005, the 35-year-old has hosted several other documentary series and produced many others. In 2019, he started Portals to Hell, a paranormal series that continues, co-starring researcher Katrina Weidman. I will be a part of uh, Fright Club, Tim. I think I filmed uh, three episodes. I pop in to kind of weigh in on a couple of the paranormal stories that they've got. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, Tim, we're at that point in the show. Our final news story is here. 
All right. Pop stars, Tim, are so bored in quarantine, they've started summoning aliens. Uh Uh-oh. Yep, celebrities are back at it again with their fascination with aliens. Back in October, Demi Lovato revealed in a surreal Instagram post that she had a UFO encounter during her retreat to Joshua Tree and urged her fans to meditate to get the planet off its negative path towards destruction. More recently, the singer had a conversation with Kesha about her extraterrestrial sighting, going into more detail about what exactly she saw along with photo evidence. The first big thing that happened was we saw this really bright light, Lovato said. This blue orb kept floating in front of us 20, 30 feet away. When I would try to walk up to it, it would just hop another 20 to 30 feet back so I could never chase it or get close to it. She also explains that Dr. Stephen Greer, the expert that led her UFO spotting retreat, named the blue orbs kindness because it had previously healed a person's hearing loss. The conversation was part of Kesha and the Creepies, Kesha's podcast about the supernatural. That's right. Somebody else has thrown their hat in the ring for another paranormal podcast, Tim. Yay. Yeah. Now Kesha has announced she's also picked up an extraterrestrial hobby thanks to Lovato. It's summoning aliens. There are a couple books Lovato mentioned and an app she mentioned that I immediately downloaded. Kesha told Entertainment Tonight. She added that uh, she told her family that all I want for Christmas is for us to all meditate and try to channel extraterrestrials. But they were apparently completely up for it. Still, no one has explained the relevance of meditation, according to this article. Somebody had to just do another little shot over the bow, Tim. Hmm to meditation so uh yeah that's it strange stories abound as always but i want to thank you all for tuning in and being a part of the program with us remember tomorrow we've got another brand new episode of darkness radio presents holzer's ghosts where we'll be examining the devil in texas case and uh, if you watch the live video stream tonight on my facebook or youtube page you can uh inject your questions comments and uh converse uh, conversate with us live on the air while we're actually filming that hour hour and 15 long uh special so again tune in to my facebook pages or the darkness radio facebook pages or to the youtube page just go to youtube.com look up darkness radio you'll find our official page there and you can follow along on those episodes all right tim that's it for this week you ready to wrap it up i am all right that's tim i'm dave we're wrapping it up you've been listening to the best in paranormal talk radio we are darkness radio darkness radio